Um, so thank you. So uh, just to reiterate, what, what, what I want to accomplish tonight is to give you your bearings for the 2021 season. You're all um, veteran uh, fish monitors with us. So I've really tried to make sure that you're not seeing last year's slideshow. I want to give you some good updates, but also remind you of EpiCollect. And I thought it'd be really great to have John here because you get tired of listening to me. And it'd be great to hear um, somebody with more expertise than me and some stats for what's happening with uh, uh, areas around the state. So whatever we can do to help, um, you know, keep you guys <laughs> engaged and interested and fascinated by these fish is uh, what I'm all, all excited about. So, uh, and then at the end, I keep in mind, uh, kind of think back to last season about things that either worked or didn't work or you thought could be improved. It is again going to be a contactless season. And again, we cannot use the gatehouse. Okay, so it's gonna be very, very similar to last season. Um, and so keep that in the back of your mind and we can have a brief discussion at the end. Uh, but at this point, uh, John, I'd love to uh, pass it over to you. I'm gonna make you a co-host. Okay. And um, if you wouldn't mind, um, I if you could just start with like telling us what your role is at the state so we have a good bearing for where you're coming from. Okay. Uh, just, okay, here we go. Okay, so um, so thank you everyone. Uh, my name is John Shepard. I'm with the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries and I work for the Diadromous Fisheries Biology Management and Restoration Project. I work out of our uh, South Shore office in New Bedford and so I'm the, uh, the area biologist uh, for Southeastern Massachusetts. So um, I oversee um, several uh, monitoring uh, programs for diadromous fish. And I work primarily in uh, Bristol and Plymouth counties, as well as uh, uh, some areas uh, on the Cape. And I work primarily uh, with uh, river herring, but I also work with American shad. And to a lesser extent, I work with some of our other diadromous fish, namely eels, uh, rainbow smelt, tom cod, um, and such. And so, um, as I mentioned, I I I, um, I oversee uh, several monitoring programs, and so I also work with um, with volunteer groups as well. Um, and it's primarily. Um, I um, I'll work with groups in in that. Um, they'll actually go out, they collect the data, and then eventually I'm the one who receives the data, I process it and analyze it, and then I produce uh, population estimates for the groups. And so, so for today, I would just, um, I, have a, I have a presentation here, I'm just gonna go over some of the, uh, some of the basics about um, conducting visual counting and then how that data gets uh, analyzed and how we produce estimates. And so, um, so this basically, this is uh, some of the topics that I'll, that I'll cover. I'll just give a, an overview of just monitoring for river herring and Massachusetts coastal streams. I'll go over some of the basic principles uh, for conducting visual counts, um, talk about uh, things like, uh, you know, where to count, um, some of the advantages, disadvantages for conducting visual counts. And then when you have that data, um, how you treat that data statistically um, to produce um, population estimates. And that'll kind of go into our, our, our counting program and then look at um, different uh, sources of data and sources of, um, of variability and error in producing estimates. And then at the end, I'll just, I'll have some case studies uh, to show you and then just some general recommendations. So, um, the data here, this is actually a summary of, um, of monitoring that we did back in 2019. Um, I didn't use last year because obviously for obvious reasons, because of COVID, um, we had a, um, a large reduction in, um, in monitoring efforts, uh, you know, primarily with, with visual counting groups. So I actually, I have 2019 uh, uh, information here and, and, and I do apologize in advance because I, I don't have, um, your site, uh, you know, shown here on the map. Um, uh, but, um, but really what I wanted to show you was that in, in 2019, it was actually one of our, um, 
our largest monitoring efforts uh, to date. Um, we monitored uh, about 50 streams um, up and down the coast of Massachusetts. And, you know, we use a variety of different uh, methods to, uh, to monitor and to count river herring. Um, as you can kind of see by, from the pie chart here, um, by far the, um, the most common method that we do use is visual counts. Um, it basically comprises two thirds of our total monitoring efforts. And so the visual counts are, you know, they're, they're basically conducted by uh, various organizations, um, including yourselves, but, you know, through min, min, you, min, uh, excuse me, municipalities, um, watershed associations and non-governmental organizations and even private organizations as well. <clears throat> and so um, just to uh, uh, review just some of the uh, basic principles for conducting visual counts, um, this was actually a method that was derived by a gentleman named Rideout, and this was actually his uh, graduate thesis work that he did in the, in the 1970s. And he actually did it on the, uh, the Parker River up in Newbury. And so basically he came up with a method um, of trying to um, estimate uh, daily passage using uh, randomized uh, uh, counts that were conducted randomly throughout the course of the day. And so I just have a, a graph here. The, um, if you see the blue line here, this blue curve, this is, uh, it, this is like your theoretical um, herring run here. And so what Rideout did was he basically, he divided the day into, into uh, time blocks like this. And then randomly throughout, you know, each day throughout the day, you would conduct ra count randomly um, uh, for each day. And so basically the blocks that are within uh, the curve here, these, are, these were observations where he actually detected or we would actually detect fish. And then the ones outside that are ones that did not detect fish. And so, Basically, what he what he would do is that the um, he would come up with estimates of daily passage, and this was based on mean passage activity uh, derived from from each of those uh, uh, random sampling events that occurred from each day, and so, and then the the cumulative sum of of those counts of those daily counts throughout the course of the spawning period uh, would come up with your estimate of run size or total population estimate. <clears throat> so that's really the basics of, of, of what he did and how visual counting is, is done. So um, one common question that I get from people who are looking to start a count is, um, you know, where should we conduct our count? And so oftentimes I'll, I'll answer their question with another question, which is, you know, um, well, it depends on, you know, what, your, what type of estimate you're hoping to achieve. Um, and so what I have here, these three maps, I have three different um, scenarios here. Um, the first one here, uh, figure A, this is actually, this is the Monument River in Plymouth and Bourne, um, where basically this is, um, a lot of people refer to it as the Cape Cod Canal Run because Little Herring Pond up here, Great Herring Pond, and then it empties directly into the Cape Cod Canal itself right here. So the red arrow here in this little box, this, actually, this is actually the location of the counting station. This is actually in one of my sites. And I actually, I monitor this using an electronic counter, but given its proximity to the outlet and where it empties into the canal here, um, the fish that are passing through this, it's basically, it's an estimation of the total population or the total run size. The uh, second example here, this is uh, figure B, this is, um, this is actually the Namaskat River in Middleborough and Lakeville. <clears throat> this is actually a tributary of the Taunton River. And so, um, so it begins up here where, it, where you know, this is the confluence here. And then eventually the herring are making their way into these uh, ponds here. This is known as the Assawampsit Complex. And the red arrow here shows this is the location of the counting station. So as you can see, it's basically the midway point between their spawning grounds and the confluence here. And so what, what they're, the estimate that they're getting here, it's, it's not an estimation of the total population. Um, 
Rather, it's an estimate of the number of fish that are just uh, that are passing beyond the counting station here. And so sometimes you'll refer to this, or sometimes this can be referred to as escapement. It's basically, it's the number of fish that are passing beyond a certain point uh, within a river. So we, it's, so we know that this is not an estimate of the actual total population, especially given the fact that we know that there are blueback herring that are in this, uh, that are in this system. And based on biological sampling that we do conduct um, as well, we know um, bluebacks do not, um, they do not enter the counting station here. So we know that this is not an estimate of total population size. And so the third example here, this is figure C, this is uh, the Akushnet River. And this is another one of my sites that I monitor. Um, this is a site that has undergone extensive restoration efforts. Uh, the, the blue triangles here, these actually are locations where we had improvements to fish passage. Namely, we had um, two partial dam removals and nature-like fishway installations here in the lower watershed, these two locations here. And then in the upper watershed up here, we had a, a fish ladder that was put in um, so that fish could enter into the New Bedford Reservoir here. And this is also the location where we have, again, another electronic counter. And so, <clears throat> uh, so for this one here, uh, given all the effort that we've had to try and improve passage, we would refer to this site as more of a restoration response. And so I guess really kind of one of the, the take home uh, messages here is that, um, you know, depending on, you know, what you're hoping to, uh, to obtain uh, for an estimate, you know, it really matters on, you know, three things location, location, and location. So, um, so I mean, I'm sure that a lot of this is probably stuff that you probably already know, but, um, you know, there are, you know, visual counts do have its advantages and its disadvantages. I mean, and uh, one advantage, uh, namely, is, you know, it's very low startup costs. Um, the figure here really shows all you really need to start up um, a visual count here. So rather than having to spend tens of thousands of dollars on electronic counters or video systems and all the um, the maintenance and everything that's associated with those uh, with that type of technology, um, <clears throat> really for a visual count, all you really need is like a field notebook, you know, perhaps a manual a tally, a stopwatch. Um, some people, you know, they, they may have thermometers that they put in or even data loggers that they can use to record either air or water temperature. And for some places, especially where visibility is poor, uh, some people will put like a, a, a reflective surface or like a whiteboard in the water so that when fish pass over it, the silhouette that they create makes, you know, seeing the fish and counting them much easier. Um, you know, some of the other advantages is that, you know, uh, you don't really need uh, security per se, you know, because you don't have to worry about, you know, again, you know, a multi-thousand dollar video monitoring or electronic counter uh, to worry about getting vandalized. Um, and also it's, it's also very good, uh, obviously, for community involvement, and it also fo fosters local stewardship of, you know, of the of the run. Um, of course, you know, like and like with any method, um, you know, it has its disadvantages. Even with higher technology, they have the disadvantages, namely, you know, the startup costs and the cost of maintenance. Um, obviously, for for visual counting, you know you have limited temporal coverage because, you know, you can't have someone standing there 24 hours a day and seven days a week counting fish. Although I've, I've heard some stories of some people who have done some rather impressive marathons of, of visual counting, but, and obviously one of the big limitations too, is that you can't, you know, it's, it's extremely difficult to try and count at night. Um, obviously for lighting reasons and things like that. Um, and also, um, the estimates that are derived from visual counting, I mean, they're, they have a lower level of accuracy as opposed to the, what you would get from an electronic counter or from a visual counter because, you know, those types of uh, methods are capable of, of monitoring 24 hours a day and seven days a week. So really it's, uh, it's, a, it's more the, um, the, the estimates that you get from, from visual counting, it's more of an index of abundance 
rather than like a, a total count or a total uh, population size estimate. Um, visual counts do require a statistical sampling design in order to treat the data properly to come up with a, a statistically accurate estimate. Um, and, and in some cases, it can be difficult to maintain um, volunteer involvement because, you know, it is voluntary. Um, some places can be difficult to get to, whether they're in remote locations or, you know, there could be safety issues like, you know, people having to like cross, you know, go into busy areas with traffic and stuff like that to count. Or even in cases where you have runs where um, a lot of times you don't see anything. And so sometimes people tend to not, um, you know, they they don't, you know, they become uh, less interested over time. And so sometimes it could be uh, challenging, especially for volunteer coordinators um, to try and maintain, you know, that level of involvement. <clears throat> so um, just to go a little bit more into like how we treat the data statistically to produce um, uh, population estimates. Um, so the initial work that was done by Rideout in the 70s was actually uh, explored further by one of my colleagues, uh, Gary Nelson. He works out of our uh, North Shore office out of Gloucester. He's a statistician. And so what we found is that, you know, Rideout's method can be, it's difficult to replicate. It's, you know, because it's a very intense uh, method to use. You know, it's, it's hard to conduct, you know, lots of counts throughout the day and it's hard to conduct them randomly. So uh, Gary ex actually explored um, alternative methods um, and alternative uh, sampling designs to try and fit to, uh, you know, to sampling data to produce estimates of run size. And so we have three different designs that are kind of shown here. Um, this first one on the left, um, this is a one-way uh, stratified sampling design. And so basically what you do is you take your you take your day and you divide it into, um, into say like a 12 hour period here. And during this day, you would conduct a minimum of two counts per day. And so basically using this type of design, it, it you know, because it's, it requires the least amount of sampling intensity, um, it does provide um, an, ac an, an estimate that's of the lowest level of, of accuracy. And so the next one here, this, uh, the one in the middle, this is a two-way, two-period um, sampling design. And so basically what you do is you would take your, you would take your day, your 12-hour period, you would actually divide it into two six-hour periods. And then within each one of these six-hour periods, you would conduct a minimum of two counts per six-hour period here. And so again, um, because the, uh, because your um, because your uh, your your uh, breaking up your sampling periods and you're conducting um, in the end you're conducting more counts per period and, and in turn per day, the estimate you're going to get is going to be of a higher level of accuracy. And then again, here on the right, this is a two-way three-period sampling design. So with your day instead of having two six hour periods, you would have three four hour periods. And then within this, uh, within each four hour period, you would conduct a minimum of three counts, which again, you know, because it's a higher sampling intensity, um, it does produce a higher level of accuracy with your estimate. So really, uh, really what, it, what these uh, three designs show you is that the more sampling that you do, and in theory, the more, the more you can randomize it if possible, the higher the level of accuracy your results are going to be. And so I'm going to go into a little bit more of this uh, coming up. So um, using all the, using this information, um, we actually designed um, a visual counting program um, that you can use to estimate um, population size. Um, this is actually, it's, it's a, it's a visual basic program. It's actually one that, um, we can actually, you know, that can actually um, be uh, given to people. I mean, a lot of people, people tend to send it to me, but in theory, people can actually do it themselves. And it's actually pretty easy to run. Um, here, all the, all the data, all the, the only data that's really required to run this program is are the ones that are highlighted in red here. So basically, 
you know, for each observation, you just need the date, the start time, the end time, and the count, or the number of fish that were observed. Now, um, in some of the fields up here where you enter your data, I mean, there's other optional data that you can enter if you want, like say the name of the, of the, per, of the person counting, um, if they collected water temperature or air temperature, weather conditions, and even extra, extraneous um, comments. Um, you know, that can all be entered in as well. I mean, it's, it's good information to have, but it's not required. It's really, it's just these four variables that are actually required to, um, to run the program. And so this is just an example of some of the uh, output data that you can get. You can get estimates of, you can actually get estimates of daily passage. You can get a, a total estimate of run size. Um, and then actually I'll go into this part uh, coming up here. <clears throat> So, um, so once we have the data and, you know, once I decide, you know, which, how I want to treat the data statistically to come up with an estimate, um, one of the next questions is, is, is how accurate is that estimate? And so one of the, one of the great features of this program is that it has a, a built-in power analysis. And so what this does is it actually looks at the um, level of accuracy and the level of precision of your estimates. And so the statistical definition of power here is, it is the ability to detect changes when they are occurring. And so there are different factors that affect, um, you know, that affect your power, you know, basically the, the, the nature of which the fish are passing, um, the big one is obviously the number of samples that you take. Um, and then these are more statistically related, you know, what level of significance that you're looking for and how big of a, uh, of a change that you would to detect. And so if you look at the graph here on the left, what you have here is you see three curves here. And so the y-axis is, is power. It's basically, it's the probability and to detect change. And then the x-axis is basically looking at um, the level of change over time. And so really what we're looking for is um, you, the steeper your, your V-shaped curve here is, it's the more, um, the higher level of power that you have in your, in your estimate or the, the higher probability of being able to detect change um, given the level of sampling intensity that you use. Um, so, and as, as it kind of shows here, as power increases, the more likely change can be detected. And so what I'm gonna go into uh, next here is I'm gonna show you some different case studies and especially things that can, uh, that affect the accuracy and the position of your estimates. And so, <laughs> so I'll try not to bore you too much with, with, with all of this, but um, basically what you have here is um, uh, we're looking at different factors that affect your accuracy and your power. And so if you look at the graph up here at figure A, the, the horizontal line here, this is say, this is your theoretical run size. And so like, it's basically, it's like, it's like a known population size here. And so as you see here, each one of these points here, um, this is an estimate and then it has confidence intervals. And as you can see, um, the confidence intervals, it's basically, it's a, it's a level of variability, you know, where, uh, to which your estimate is. And so, really, as you can see here, is that the more, uh, the more counts that you do throughout the course of the day, um, the smaller the confidence intervals become. And so therefore the accuracy and the precision of your estimate increases with more counts that you take. Now, um, if you look at figure B here, this is an example of what we call um, pattern sampling. Um, we realize that for a lot of for a lot of groups, it's hard for people to just go out at a at any random point in the day to go out and count. A lot of times, people, you know, they, you know, they're working or you know they've got other obligations, or, you know, they're like, well, I can only get to the river to count, you know, say uh, at eight o'clock in the morning on my way to work, and then. I could go again at five o'clock on my way home. And so a lot of times, you know, that creates, uh, you know, you see kind of a pattern in the sampling here. And so again, this is your theoretical run size here. Uh, these are your estimates. This is a scenario where say you were only sampling in the afternoon. So um, as you can see, the, um, the, uh, the estimates here, you know, they're above the actual, um, 
population estimate here. And even though you're conducting more counts uh, throughout the day, and even though the, uh, the confidence intervals are getting smaller, um, so the precision's increasing, but the accuracy is not. And it's largely because the, uh, the counts during the morning here are, are not being represented here. So what you're doing is you're actually, you're artificially weighting um, the counts that are conducted here in the afternoon. So it doesn't really create an accurate representation of, of, what, your, of what your run size is. And so another big one that we find, or another big source of error that we find with counting is that, you know, are days where you don't have counts. Um, you know, you missed, you missed a day or so. Um, and so you can actually see that with the graphs here. So these basically show um, the effect of, of, um, of, of missing sequences or missing time um, and how they affect the accuracy of your of your estimates. So this is basically day. This is where you have like one day of missing counts, two days of missing counts, three and four. As you can see, the the more time that that passes without any counts that are being done, um, the higher level, the higher the level of error that you're going to have in your estimates because um, the program has to extrapolate. Um, uh, over a, a broader period of time. And so when it does that, it introduces more variability in your data. <clears throat> so these are just some, uh, some examples here of, of some of these different scenarios. So the one on the top here, this is say you have a really small run. You have a really small herring run. And oftentimes what we see is that, it, especially with small runs, it occur they tend to occur over a, a, a very small window of time. And so if you have, if you, unless you happen to be there and, you know, you happen to see the fish, you know, uh, passing, um, you know, a lot of times you, you have periods where there's, there's no activity here. And so um, a lot of times that can really affect uh, the accuracy of your estimates. So this is the power analysis here. And you can see this really um, kind of this flat curve. Um, so it basically, it, it's the, given the level of, of, of sampling that you, uh, for this, you know, the ability to detect change over time is, is weak. Um, the second example here, this is one that I commonly see with a lot of groups and it's, you know, it's really through nobody's fault. It's just, you know, uh, a lot of times it could just be a small group. Um, and, you know, people just can't get out to, uh, to count that much, but really what you see here, this is the effect of, of a low sample size where a lot of these days where there was only one or two counts conducted per day, and then you also see periods where you have missing counts, days where no counts were done. So this would be, you know, basically both of these would probably be analyzed using a one-way sampling design. And so because of the, uh, the low number of counts and the days where you have no counts, it affects your power here um, again. Now, the one on the bottom here, this is an example of what we call aggregate sampling. So this is kind of like when you're only sampling during a specified period. Um, this is a run where it's well known that the fish tend to pass mostly during the evening hours. So we have basically between the hours of seven and nine o'clock. And so um, the, the, the person coordinating the count, you know, he, he, well, he tended to send his people out mostly during this period because he knew there were fish there. Um, so as you can see, this, this period of time here is very well represented, whereas the rest of the day is underrepresented here. Um, and so again, that's um, because you're, you're heavily weighting um, this particular period of the day, um, you know, it, it, it really does affect um, it does affect your your um, your accuracy and your precision again once again. Um, so these are just some of the various examples that we have of, of different sources of error and how they affect um, your your estimates. So what I'm going to do is I, I have three more case studies to show you. These are actually ones where um, these are actually like really good um, really good visual counts. Um, and so this first one here, this is the Namaskat River in Middleborough. Um, this is actually a time series that actually, it's actually now, uh, going on 24 years now. Um, it's a volunteer visual count. Um, it's actually done by, a, a, 
a commission made by from the towns of Middleborough and Lakeville. Um, they're volunteers, but they're appointed by the town, um, and they're they're great stewards of 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 this run. Um, they do a two way, two period stratified sampling design. So this is kind of this this graph here kind of shows you the number of counts that they do throughout the course of the day, um, but it's a consistent. Um, sampling intensity. It's a consistent design uh, used throughout the entire time series. Um, in addition to that, in addition to the abundance data that they're collecting from their visual counts, it's actually also supplemented with biological data that we collect. We actually collect herring from the run each week and we get population demographics uh, data. So given the, uh, the longevity of this time series, the consistency of, of which um, the counts have been conducted, and along with the biological sampling data, um, you know, this river has now been incorporated into the ASMFC uh, coastwide stock assessment for river herring. Um, as you can kind of see here, that again, this shows you um, the power analysis here. Um, as you can see, it's this real steep curve. And so this is really what you want to see because it's your, your probability of being able to detect change is very high. <clears throat> Uh, this is another one. This is the Marsons Mills River. This is in Marsons Mills uh, on the Cape. Um, this was a, a 14 year time series, which um, unfortunately last year they didn't, um, they couldn't continue it, um, obviously, uh, you know, for COVID reasons. Um, but this is the one where it's another, it's another volunteer visual count. Um, they use a two way, three period stratified sampling design. So basically, what they were doing is they were more or less having people show up. It wasn't exactly random. They were more or less having people show up um, each hour of the day. And so, and you can actually see that here that for the most part, each hour of the day is, is, is um, it's almost evenly uh, represented here, which is really what you, you, you would like to see with your, with your counts here. And it actually does show it in the power analysis here. Again, we have this nice steep curve. It has a high probability of being able to detect changes here. And uh, my last example here, this is the Mystic River. Um, this is in the Boston Harbor watershed. Um, this one uh, uh, is an eight year time series, um, which um, last year they didn't do the visual count, um, but actually what they did was they did run a video monitoring system. So, I mean, they, they were still able to get um, data from last year. But again, you know, kind of like the Marsons Mills, um, for the most part, they, they have a very large volunteer base because basically it's, uh, it's the Medford uh, Yacht Club, I think that, and the Mystic River Watershed Association. So it's those two organizations that teamed up together. Um, so they, have a, they had a large uh, a group of volunteers and they were able to come out randomly during the day, each day to come out and count. And so, as you can see, each hour of the day is, is fairly evenly represented here. And again, you see it with this, uh, with this nice steep curve in the, in the power analysis here. Um, so, um, so basically, um, the, um, all this information actually came from a, uh, it was actually a workshop that we did back in 2006 at the Jones River watershed where we actually had like all these volunteer groups come together and they kind of shared their uh, experiences with us and provided a, us with a lot of information. And that's really what led to the, to the creation of this, uh, of this um, sampling or this visual counting program and actually this technical report down here, uh, which is available on our website. But, um, what, but from this workshop, uh, we came up with some general recommendations and those recommendations being that, you know, that visual counting programs follow a, a two-way stratified random sampling design, whether it's a two-way two-period or a two-way three-period sampling design. Ideally, we would like to see it be a three-period sampling design, so which you would make you would make at least a minimum of three 10-minute counts during three four hour daily periods. And this is just an example of those four hour time blocks. You would try to do a minimum of three counts within each of these time blocks. And then you would actually, and then you would conduct counts, you know, each day throughout the entire spawning run. Now, 
I have these, uh, these are examples here. These aren't absolute um, because different runs, I mean, these can actually be tailored to, um, to your run um, because some, I mean, some runs don't start on April 1st and they don't necessarily end on June in the middle of June. I mean, for example, like in the region where I'm working, um, which is primarily, um, uh, you know, uh, the Taunton River watershed, Narragansett Bay watershed, uh, Buzzards Bay, and the South Shore, um, a lot of our runs tend to start earlier. I mean, a lot of them tend to start in early to mid-March. Um, a good example is the Namaska River. That usually tends to start at the beginning of March. And some of the other runs that we do. So, you know, they're starting prior to April. Some of them end before mid-June. Some of them actually end beyond that, like the Monument River um, can go all the way up to the end of June. And I and a lot of times um, the timing of these runs can tend to follow a geographic uh, pattern where our more southern runs tend to start, a lot of them tend to start earlier than our northern runs. You know, the water warms up quicker. And so that that's one of the uh, primary migration triggers for river herring. So, um, so, you know, don't take these, uh, don't take these recommendations as uh, universal. They're not universal for every river. Um, it's kind of more for, they're kind of more as just general guidelines. So, I mean, when you think about, you know, your counting program and if there's any changes that you want to make, you know, you can tailor it to kind of more suit your run. Um, since, you know, you have uh, intimate knowledge of your run, you know, you would be you you would be the ones that would best be able uh, to make those decisions on how you want to uh, to tailor your program, and so um, there was so again this is a reference here on our website. Um, there was uh, before I end there was a uh, one other um, uh, if you're interested in in, in more things uh, river herring. Um, I'm also serve on the steering committee for the River Herring Network, which is basically it's uh, you know it's a it's a it's a network of 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 local stewards, herring wardens, um, scientists, and citizen scientists as well. That we uh, we basically um, we discuss all things herring, um, um, everything from uh, state and federal uh, regulations and updates to current research. Um, and restoration projects. Um, we, we typically have um, uh, at least one to two meetings every year. And so if any of you are interested, I can, always, I can give uh, Jane the, uh, the, the contact information. Um, you know, it's a very welcoming group. They take everybody. Um, it's mostly, I mean, it, it initially started in the Southern part of Massachusetts, but there's actually, um, Actually, I believe they've actually started one for the North Shore as well. It's, I mean, it's basically, it's under the same network, but they actually started one for the North Shore as well because I sometimes the North Shore people can't, they can't always get down to the annual meetings. So I can give you that information uh, when we're done. So um, with that, um, you know, thanks everyone I, for your time and I appreciate it. Thank you, John. Well, that was a that was a great look at at the statistics. Um, we are a um, we try to go for nine minimum times a day. Um, so we're doing uh, ten minutes every hour, twelve or thirteen of uh, twelve or thirteen hours a day, and try to hit a minimum of nine of those hours. Mm -hmm. um, so we were doing um, we were doing must uh, far fewer times a day, but now that we have the volunteer capacity, we're trying to hit a minimum of nine a day. Mm -hmm. So I, I love that graph that, that you showed that had the, um, um, yeah, keep going up, not that one. <laughs> uh, the one that had the, 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 keep going up. It was a great, oh no, that's, um, I don't know how to describe it. It had all the charts on it. Katie, help me. Keep going, keep going. That one right there, number 10. That one, the upper left okay. one there on that is perfect. That exactly, that's exactly what Lisa's all about. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
<laughs> trying to increase the the accuracy by getting more counts per day. Um, of course, we had fish should be even better, but um, it's called sign up early and sign up often. <laughs> so uh, we are we would love to get out of the habit of saying zero is a great number this year. Well, if and you know what, and that's something I should have. Um, that's something I should have mentioned. I, I usually mention it to, to groups when I give this talk. Um, I know that sometimes people can find, uh, you know, that, you know, if they're not seeing fish, you know, it could be something, uh, it could be somewhat discouraging or sometimes, you know, people can quickly lose interest. I try to emphasize to people that zero observations actually is important data. Um, it's important for a lot of different reasons. Um, and it's largely because we know that, um, we know that uh, uh, that when the, the herring migrate, they don't hike, they don't migrate in a uniform manner. It's oftentimes it's it's um, it's it can be irregular. Sometimes it it can be uh, somewhat patterned, and there are different reasons that could affect that. Whether it's um, something environmental, um, you know, what uh, certainly water temperature, flow, um, certainly do dictate. Um, do dictate migration patterns. In some cases, sometimes it can even be things like lunar cycle, um, especially if you're if you're conducting. Um, uh, you know, one of the examples that I did have, you know, especially this one here on the bottom here, um, where they're they're showing that you know a lot of the migration is only happening at in the evening hours. Well, you know, further investigation into this site, you know, led us to some other revelations. Um, you know, whereas, you know, they're seeing largely nothing during the day. And what we found part of that being uh, was because uh, the location of the site, it was actually, um, you know, it's at the exit of the ladder where they're counting. Below the ladder, it's tidal. Um, so we certainly found that tide is part of it, but it's also, it also runs through an open, uh, what used to be a cranberry bog that's now, it's now undergone restoration. But what we're, what we were finding is that or what we what we theorize is that a lot of times the fish are kind of you know because it's because it was like landscaped uh, cranberry bog areas there wasn't areas where you had a lot of um, natural cover so fish we theorize that fish you know they become vulnerable to predators you know like seagulls other birds even other animals and so sometimes they have to wait for the cloak uh, you know they have to wait for the uh, the cloak of darkness, so to speak, to, to pass or, or even during like high tide cycles on overcast days where visibility is much less, you know, it's safer for them to move. Um, so, you know, it could be, we suspect that it could be a behavioral effect as well as a tidal component that could be uh, governing, you know, their, their movement patterns. So there's, there's, there could be a lot of reasons for that, but, you know, if people are going there, they're not seeing fish. It's still important information. I mean, zero uh, a zero observation is still an important data point. Is really the point I'm trying to make. I had a question for you, Jane, about um, the white board that's in the water that was supposed to, you know it's supposed to make it easier to see the fish pass over it. But with the bubbles that you get, we were getting like weird false images that made you think there were fish there. Other places I've seen have a flat board that's a little lot wider. I don't know if it's possible with the type of ladder we have, if you can put a wider board that's like a foot wide so you can actually see something that might pass over it easier. Um, yeah, I'll talk with, uh, we're, we're installing the weir on Wednesday and uh, uh, the whiteboard I think was a, was a, a big improvement. Uh, we're limited in the width of that slack that we have to work with. Um, and if the water level is too high, a wider board down at the bottom, um, um, one would have a hard time staying in place and two is just too deep. Um, right, and that's why, yeah, I. I thought it might be a little difficult there. Know, I've, I've actually thought in low water to go in there and like paint the whole thing with pool paint, you know? <laughs> yeah, even yeah, even maybe the sides, trying yeah. to get, yeah, this co the concrete painted white yeah. even. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. 
Any other questions for John? One quick question, John. Uh, given the, the that Lisa set a, has set up in the past uh, four one-hour uh, segments in which we choose a time, how important is it to be random within that one-hour segment? It is something that we uh, we we do try to encourage. Um, the uh, I mean, although the uh, the the one thing that's nice about this program uh, that we use um, is that it, it is very robust. Um, you, um, you know, we can use it to treat, you know, uh, different types of data. Um, and so I, I would really say that, you know, of course, you know, depending on how that data is collected, it will affect um, the accuracy of, of the results. And so um, I, I would, I would really say that, um, you know, probably write outs method was probably the one that, I mean, ideally, if you could follow it, it would be best, um, you know, where it's basically they're trying to do as many counts uh, and as randomized as possible throughout the day. Um, I guess really the, 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 the whole thing about randomization is that you try to avoid pattern sampling or aggregate sampling. So it's kind of the uh, uh, looking at, you know, you're trying to avoid this type of scenario here. Um, so <clears throat> that's really one of the advantages of trying to randomize it. But of course, you know, we realize it, it's not necessarily easy for people to just, you know, go out randomly at any point throughout the day. So that's why we, we kind of came up with these alternative sampling designs so that it's still possible to estimate or to come up with estimates, you know, so long as you don't have like, you know, really low, really, really low sample sizes, then it really becomes then it really becomes statistically impossible to do so. All right. Well, John, thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate your time, everyone. Yeah, and you're welcome to stick around. Um, I, okay. I'm only gonna talk for a few minutes and then okay. uh, we'll have a little discussion. Um, you're welcome to stick around, but um, it's a weeknight too, so you're welcome to take <laughs> off. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I've uh, got another, another early call tomorrow. So, yeah, but, well, uh, we appreciate your time. Okay. But um, yeah, if, if any questions come up, please feel free to shoot me an email. Um, and I'll send you, I'll send you um, some of those other links, um, you know, that you All can right, pass we'll on to the out. group. Okay. Great. All right. Thank great. you, everyone, well, once again. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. Bye bye now. All right. All right, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, yes. All right. All right, so welcome to our 2021 training. Um, we are fortunate this year that we are indeed going to have the weir installed it took a, a little bit of wrangling uh it took like a, um, a, a a call with state agencies and federal agencies and really having to pin down who's going to help out uh the weir is what houses our camera and unfortunately mike left last spring and he has, has not been replaced so and I could literally not get the people in his office to uh, to help. <laughs> they have the camera. And so luckily Ben got the camera, got the wiring. Um, so we'll have the camera and we'll have the weir and video uh, in place this year. So that's great. So Ben is really uh, stepping up to help out. So Ben works for the state and on the left is Mike, who you guys all remember. But Mike has gone on, as you learned last year, Mike has gone on to help out nationally with fish runs. So that's pretty exciting to have one of our friends there. Um, so um, poor Lindsay, I X'd out his, uh, his, his paper sheet there. So we are gonna be trying to be contactless as possible again. Uh, the other thing that's good news this year is that the gentleman that owns the fish ladder, Kevin Olson, is 
Um, he had a back injury last year, so he really couldn't even help us juggle things around. Uh, so that'll be, that'll be good to have his extra hands as well. So we're ditching the data sheets. Uh, if any of you are, are um, really want to stick with them, that's fine. But I think we got through last year without really needing them, except for maybe some photos. So uh, we'll work with you depending on what your technology needs are. But we are moving to the, um, the EpiCollect app has been updated. Uh, so you will need to, we're using it for three. So we've got three programs up, projects up. So when you go into EpiCollect, um, Spencer, I think, I, if, I think this is the, you're, you may be the, this, you may be the only person this is new for. Um, Actually, if you used it last, uh, last time, I'm, I'm, I think I used it. Okay, yeah. great. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely remember using something similar at least. Um, okay, great. So I definitely didn't use it. <laughs> I'm still on paper. There, okay, there are a few fine. people. Uh, I think we had two or three people that were using paper. Which is That's fine. Okay. It's just, uh, I, I don't know if I can enter them onto EpiCollect. You can. Just via the computer, I might be able to just do that. Yeah, you can. It's easy. And then it's all in one place. So I'll, I'll even show you how to do that on this. So I just want to make sure that you you know you get the 2021 Concord Alewife Monitoring Project when you go into EpiCollect. So for those of you that were doing it on your phone, just pick that project uh and and it's a different logo for the trust it's the one that celebrates our 30th anniversary we're also using it for our turtle head starting program for those of you that aren't aware we are uh we've been raising eight blandings hatchlings and they're doing great and they're going to be released in june but we have volunteers that are helping out with that and uh so that's why we're using that system as well for that So uh, this is to remind me to tell you that if you feel like there's something that needs to be changed in, in EpiCollect, it's not a tough thing to change. Uh, so uh, don't hesitate to make recommendations. So just running through this quickly as a couple of reminders, you're going to want to add the project. And also, I note that this, I noted in, that this says 2021 on the top, and then it says 2020 Concord River Alewife Monitoring. I have updated that, so everything says 2021. Uh, just remember that your, your time end is automatically entered for you if you do it at the end of your count. Uh, so that's easy to do. Uh, you have... The next one is you have lots of options for weather. Just remember that uh, that the the weather selections are important um, and they're a little bit subjective. If you want help with that, let us know. And then on, we are okay. asking people as usual to count for the Concord River. One of the really interesting things last year from all the data that you collected is that we picked up on uh, eight times the use of the Greenway from one year to the next. So from the pandemic to the pre-pandemic, eight times the use of the Greenway, which is pretty amazing. Um, and I've made a special note here because you all will be the eyes and ears out there as construction is happening on the Greenway. So feel free to note things that you see on the Greenway. Um, there will be trucks traveling on the Greenway and that's okay. Uh, they're down at the far end where a bridge is being installed and there's going to be like a giant crane moved in. It's a prefab bridge that's going in. Uh, if you've gotten, you'll be able to see the bridge abutments when you park uh, on Centennial Island if you haven't already. So that's kind of exciting. So just uh, if there's any urgent issue with the ladder, um, especially just realize that that we don't get an email for every single uh, entry that you do. We have to go in and physically look at your data entry. So if there's um, something urgent that you need to let us know, there's a log stuck in the weir or there's been vandalism, um, you know, shoot us an email, okay? Don't assume that just because you've entered it here that we're gonna see it immediately. Lisa, did you have a question? 
Yeah, the one thing I think last year, some people would enter the information later on and the time would come in later. And I honestly can't remember if the end time was the same or if the end time can be overridden if you're entering it like via computer later on. But I would notice that I th think, gee, somebody hadn't shown up, but then they'd enter the, the information the next day, and but it would show up on a different, you know, different line when I open up the thing. It wouldn't be chronological in the, uh, the way I was accessing it. And I'm accessing it on a computer. Um, okay. All right, that's interesting. just something. Uh, maybe if somebody's entering it later, just put that in the comment the first time you do it. So just so I know that I'm getting it or interpreting it correctly, and that would help me. Uh, the other thing I should add is that the uh, fellow who's running the uh, condos, apartments, I think there are apartments there. Um, the properties did say that there's going to be, I think, some days where the parking lot will be closed because they're going to have a lot of heavy equipment and they're taking the extra spaces for when they're putting that bridge in. But he'll let us know. And on those days, you can park right on uh, Lawrence on Lawrence Street or whatever the street is right in front. But he'll give us warning and, and I'll shoot out an email at that point. And Lisa, that's likely to happen after our season is over. Oh, OK. He told yeah, me yeah, he that's... wasn't aware of that. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, it's likely to happen after the season. Even better. Yeah, or at the tail end of it. So, Super. but there is always parking on Lawrence Street if you ever have a problem parking in the Centennial Island lot. Uh, a couple of reminders towards the end when you're uploading the data. Um, you have the option while you're out there of uploading photos and videos. So please do so when you're out there. Um, we love to see your photos and video. Uh, and, um, you know, Tom, even you can upload photos of your pages of the day, um, if you want, cause you take great, uh, you, you do wonderful drawings and notes. Uh, so feel free to just take a, po a photo of, um, of, you know, anything that you're seeing out there and, and, and it's pretty easy to do it. There's a, um, one photo and one video limit, right? Or is there um, the ability to do no, more? No, I believe you can do more than that. You can do oh, more than one. Great. Yeah. Uh, and then there are a couple that you, you need to hit. You need to remember to go all the way through and hit save entry. And you'll get this, um, this reminder here that says all entries are uploaded. And if you forget one or say you don't have Wi-Fi wherever you are, you'll get this orange bar that says upload now, uh, just to remind you that you have entries that need to be uploaded, okay? So those are for the unsynced ones. This is how you can access the data online. Any of you can do this. Uh, and I, I just confirmed myself because I, I, I signed out and logged in uh, through a completely different account and made sure that this really does work well and it does. So you can always go in through this EpiCollect on your computer and just again, make sure you're looking at the 2021 one and uh, click view and you'll be able to see the data. So that's where you get your view data and then this is actual data from last year. This is what it looks like behind the scenes. And what you do have to remember is that there's this bar at the bottom and you really have to scroll over to the right. We don't have any flexibility with this system to be able to narrow these columns so you can see more data at the same time. But you can, any of you can go in there and just say, hey, I wonder what, um, you know, I wonder what Spencer was seeing, what's going on? And you can look at his data. Not to pick on you, Spencer. <laughs> and then you could pick up a, um, you can actually go into a selection and look at it. And if you enter something wrong, we have the capacity on our end to go in and edit things. So don't hesitate to ask us to edit something. Say you got the time wrong or the weather wrong, we can change that.
So just a few reminders, we're going to start this Saturday. Uh, I know Lisa is super anxious to uh, get some people signed up. Again, it's 10 minutes an hour and you just heard all about how, um, you know, it'd be great if we could randomize that hour. Uh, but I'm certainly not going to stop you from coming if you can only come at five o'clock and um, I'm still happy to have you. <laughs> so if you can't come at 535 or something like that. The Google Calendar is set up on the website. It's all updated and ready to go. Um, and you are all registered. And the Waterhead Mill is ready to welcome us. Uh, we will be happy this year to not be walking across brand new uh, grass seed. <laughs> so that'll be nice. In fact, uh, they've been warned that on Friday, unfortunately after rain on Thursday, the truck is coming in to deliver the weir. So I'll be curious to see what happens with that. Uh, there is no access through the gatehouse again, uh, but I will be having the computer laptop in there uh, this year. Oh, I wasn't able to last year. So you'll have to walk up through the gate and this little, this little thing is out of the way. But so there, that's in the right way. So just- Are to you gonna be sending, sorry, are you gonna be sending the email with the car, car sign or do we not really need it this year? I think you'll need it more this year than last year, actually, because there's more cars in there. Okay, so you are going to send an email with a sign for us to put, or should we? Yes. Make one for our own? Yeah. Well, yeah, and we'll he, said and if, that, uh, he said that he said that there's some spaces that are actually specifically marked. I think it's more along the back that are marked for residents. So make sure you don't park in those. But he's he's very reasonable, so uh, he's not um, like he won't come out and yell at you. <laughs> yeah, they've been great. They're, they're, really they're great. very nice folks. We just don't want to overstay our welcome. Um, and actually, let me, I just want to say one more thing on the, on the ladder. Um, you know, we noticed last year the problems with the trash gate and that there is, the trash gate has a, a giant gap in it. Last year, that was really disappointing because, um, or maybe two years ago, because Mike had put out tagged fish and then they were just coming up and going straight into the hydro station. They weren't stopped by the trash gate. Um, but the repair to the trash gate is at least a $100,000 repair. So we're working with, um, uh, it's tricky because the Olsons have a FERC exemption for that site and it's hard to find federal money to support a site that has a FERC, FERC exemption because really it's their responsibility to take care of that fish ladder and maintain it. Um, but this definitely falls into a gray area and um, the Olsons also just had, ex you know, had like a million dollar project this summer on their hydro station that they weren't expecting. Um, so he's not going to come up with any money anytime soon to fix that trash gate. And it cannot be temporarily repaired because the force of the water would just rip off anything that we put in there. Uh, uh, Jane, um, yeah, I was, Brian. I was at a training um, about uh, dam removal and they said there is now federal monies for dam owners to repair dams. It wasn't there before, but it's a new thing. So I don't know if that would apply to that. Yeah, the, um, yeah, I don't know if that'll apply that for that either. Uh, I'm working with the organization for the Assabet River. Uh, we're trying to find some, some funding together to support that. Mm. Okay. So I do think that the, I do think that more funding will become available relatively soon. Yeah. I just really wanted to get, help you guys understand that it wasn't going to be fixed this year and it might not be fixed for a little while and we don't have any control over it. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, um, but it is stable for you to go out there. Mm -hmm. And also the company on the other side of the trash gate is also um, really supportive of the project as well. Okay. So, all right, so just a couple of um, safety reminders, you know, there's always 911. Um, uh, please don't climb into the fish ladder if you're, especially if you're alone. Um, and youth should be there. We we can get you uh, uh, PFDs for for children, 
Uh, I know that a couple of people last year borrowed them for the season and that's, we'd be happy to have you do that. Uh, and if you see any problems, just let us know. So what I'm really interested in is, actually, let me ask you this first. Uh, I, I wanna tell you that we're gonna do a count on, I'm gonna stop sharing so I can see your faces. Uh, we're going to oh, a trail. Of course it herring there. <laughs> what? Back up one slide, the, the, the frozen herring that a couple of folks have actually mentioned in their emails to me that they were going to miss the frozen herring that comes oh. up. <laughs> From Mike, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so um, we are going to be conducting a trail count over a very short period of time, only a matter of um, a few days. It starts May 18th, I believe, and we just need help um, there's a two hour period in the morning and a two hour period in the day. I think it's only about 10 hours total. And we just need someone to literally be on the Greenway at the Lawrence Street section for an hour or two during that time and to help us with the trail count. It's uh, super easy. So if any of you are interested, um, I'll have Lisa get out the news to you um, just to help us cover those time periods. So you won't be the only people we ask, but if any of you are interested in helping us, uh, we've been given, uh, we're, what we're really trying to do is get a baseline uh, and, and it'll be integrated into statewide data for the Greenway, which is kind of exciting. It hasn't been before. And we're getting a baseline before the new bridge is installed. Uh, so we're really excited about the opportunity to be able to do that. and. The folks at um, at the regional planning agency that collects the data was really super excited to be able to add the greenway to that as well. So with that said, um, let's see. Um, I, I'm trying to keep an eye on the on the chat, but are there any questions that you guys have or any comments about? Is there a lock at the gate this year? There's no lock. No locks, just walk right in. Right, there wasn't last year either. Oh, I didn't make it up because of COVID. Yeah, right. Bummer. Yeah, so they make it really easy. Brian? Um, I will be glad to do any poison ivy removal. I am a blessed person who doesn't catch it, or if I get it, it's highly minimal. I love so it. Wow. The, as it grows along the path, I'll clear it out. Okay, thank you. Yep. In the same position, too. Thank you, since Never I'm thought. sensitive to it. I also, to, when I've been down there in the past years, when I've seen poison ivy on the trails, I've just pulled it up. Yeah. Wow, it. you guys are lucky. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's really helpful to the rest of us. Yeah, just don't shake my hand afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> also, just being mindful of the ticks, especially with the more mild winter. Yeah, has anyone had ticks out there? I already got one on me. <laughs> but out, out on the out on the island, has anyone gotten oh. ticks? I haven't. Yeah, no. I haven't either. I'll be curious. I, I oh, I'll great. Be curious if we get any this year. Um, tell me in general, did you guys feel safe out there, even though you didn't have access to the gatehouse and the safety equipment? Did you feel like it was safe COVID-wise with um, being contactless? I had no issues. Even with people we met out there, you know, everybody, I mean, we all pretty much stayed away, you know, enough away from okay. each other and, you know, um, just had nice conversations with everybody. So it, it was fine. I felt safe out there. No issues. Okay. All right. I, great. You know, the, there was nothing out there that caused me any anxiety at all. And occasionally there would be some kids making the trash gate bridge there and that was actually fun because I got to show them what we were doing and what happens on the island there, something that they weren't aware of. Right. Right. And with the new um, COVID uh, change this Friday that you don't have to wear a mask outside. Are we required to wear a mask when we go there? Um, no, I, um, I'm okay if you're not. I think you should be respectful of if you run into somebody else, maybe have one on hand. <laughs> In case someone who's not uh, vaccinated, mm -hmm. um, that's all. Just be respectful of each other. All right. Um, 
Anything else? Okay, good. So you guys felt like last year went pretty well, reconsidering, because we're going to do it again this year. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so you'll, you'll probably see me out there quite a bit more keeping an eye on the laptop. Um, so if you go and you see the gatehouse open, feel free to pop your head in and say hi to me, because um, I, I do run into quite a few of you when I'm out there uh, doing that. So and I, I so I I saw Bridget's comment that she's happy not to have to go through the gatehouse. Yeah. <laughs> That's not the easiest thing to get through there either. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm I just uh you guys are treasures and I'm so happy that you all are involved with the uh, with the monitoring. I hope this summer we can have a volunteer appreciation. Um you know, maybe we can, maybe we'll be able to do that in person. That would be wonderful. So, um, well, thank you all for spending your time with us tonight and getting all caught up on what's going on. Um, you'll hear a lot more from us and uh, we really appreciate you guys all stepping up to help get the season launched a little early, um, but earlier than we were expecting. So, yeah. um, so thank you all so much. I'll stick around in case there's any Thank other you. questions, okay? Thanks, Thanks Jay. Thank you. Thank you.